good morning, afternoon, or evening to everyone, depending on what part of the world you're in. Again, thanks for joining us for our Skull to Sacrum uh, 2020 virtual course. I'm glad you're with us. My uh, discussion today will be on rod application and correction maneuvers uh, from a posterior approach for uh, uh, adult spinal deformity. My disclosures. So fundamentals uh, that I uh, uh, apply uh, in deformity correction maneuvers include uh, applying my rod from cephalad to caudad when uh, not instrumenting to the sacrum and pelvis. Uh, con uh, conversely, when I'm instrumenting to the sacrum and pelvis, I apply my rod from caudad to cephalad. And you'll see that in uh, uh, several cases I'm going to highlight. Importantly, my first correction maneuver is always based on sagittal plane correction. The second maneuver on coronal plane, and lastly, the axial plane. I always think in that order, uh, my rod application and force application. In addition, something that I've learned over time is locking the sagittal plane correction on one side does not change the sagittal alignment overall, no matter what you do on the contralateral side. So that's why it's important to lock in your sagittal alignment with your initial maneuver. So I'm gonna highlight three adult idiopathic scoliosis cases here that I think hopefully will bring home the points and these fundamentals that I would like to uh, present to you today. So the first is a double major adult idiopathic scoliosis treated with a T4 to L4 posterior spinal fusion. Here's the uh, uh, upright AP and lateral x-rays, a 60 degree thoracic, 80 degree lumbar curve. You see the focal lumbar kyphosis in between and the thoracic lordosis in the sagittal plane. So the supine image in the middle kind of shows some uh, correction, but still relatively stiff curves. So those yellow arrows point to the levels I'm going to do my posterior column osteotomies to loosen up the spine in the front of the plane, uh, in frontal plane and also the sagittal plane. So my first rod application is going to be on the left side. Here, basically I grab the rod on top and then I cantilever and push the rod down on the left side to correct the thoracal lumbar kyphosis and also improve the scoliosis. Next, on that same rod, I have reduction screws on the main thoracic region to lift up and posteriorly medially translate the thoracic apex for both scoliosis correction and the production of thoracic kyphosis. Next, on that same rod, I do thoracic con concave distraction and thoracal lumbar convex compression. Again, to both to correct the sagittal plane into thoracic kyphosis and removing kyphosis in the thoracic lumbar junction and slightly increasing it in the lower lumbar spine. Next, I do some insight to coronal contouring uh, to optimize the coronal alignment in both the thoracic and lumbar region. And Lastly, I add my right-sided rod now, and really the only maneuver I'm going to do there is some uh, apical translation and derotation with reduction screws for the concavity of the lumbar curve. Lastly, I do some compression of the thoracic convexity and uh, distraction of uh, the lumbar concavity on the right side, again, appropriate for the sagittal plane realignment. And the last thing I do is to horizontalize L3 and L4 I compress up on the left-sided screws and distract down on the right-sided screws, again, in order to hor completely horizontalize L3 and L4 and center that on the sacrum. So here's the two-year post-operative radiographs showing near uh, perfect coronal realignment and uh, improved sagittal realignment, both in the thoracic uh, spine for creating kyphosis and removing the thoracal lumbar junctional kyphosis uh, uh, as well. And the clinical photos highlights the three-dimensional correction of the trunk as well, especially on the uh, uh, axial views. Second case is a larger, older adult idiopathic thoracal lumbar and lumbar scoliosis treated with a T3 to sacrum, posterior column osteotomies, T lifts, and a two-rod construct. This 62-year-old female presented with this 42-degree thoracic, 102 degree major thoracal lumbar curve and 58 degree structural lumbar sacral curve. See the sagittal plane alignment is uh, reasonable uh, regionally and globally. So the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, T-lifts at the lower three levels. You see she has actually six lumbar lumbar vertebra. So I'm doing T-lifts at L4, 5, 5, 6, and 6, 1. And these are not only for fusion, but for correction as well. I'm gonna try and push the cages uh, into the concavity of the left sided curve uh, 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 in the lumbar sacral region, again, to optimize, to try and horizontalize L4 to sacrum as much as possible. Then I'm going to additionally do posterior column osteotomies to release the main thoracal lumbar curve 
uh, obviously, which is quite stiff and, uh, and large in its uh, magnitude. So here now we're gonna apply our uh, instrumentation on our rods. The first rod applied is going to be the right-sided rod. And I'm gonna apply it again distally connecting into the S2EI screw. Then I'm gonna capture S1, L5, L6 and L5 and start compressing down on the right side. Again, that creates a little bit of lumbosacral lordosis and also starts to horizontalize L4, L5 and L6. Then I stop. And I leave uh, and I apply my left sided rod again distally, capturing the S2AI screw, then S1, L6, L5, and L4, and I distract on that side. Again, since my, uh, I've already compressed and locked in the right side, my distraction does not remove lumbosacral lordosis. It just further horizontalizes the lower lumbar vertebra for coronal correction. And often I'll go back and do this again. I'll do the right side compression at the bottom, left side distraction, until I see that all four or five and six are much more horizontalized uh, in the coronal plane. And then I continue on with my left sided rod and push it down for cantilever correction of the main thoracal lumbar curve. Uh, again, to push the ro rotation down, push the uh, uh, coronal plane more to the side uh, uh, over medially. Uh, and then start capturing that rod also in the top part of the thoracic construct. Next, I do left-sided inside to coronal correct, uh, correction. Uh, again, the, to immediately translate that uh, very deviated apex of the left-sided curve. So this is all occurring with the left-sided rod. The right-sided rod is still hanging up in the air. I'm not attached that to the spine at all. Everything's free except for the distal component, lower component of the right-sided rod. Now I take the right-sided rod and capture the apical reduction screws on the concavity and pull, translate, and derotate the uh, lumbar apex to the right-sided rod. Here's my final correction. Again, two years post-op, we see very nice uh, improvement of the coronal alignment, uh, maintenance of the sagittal alignment uh, here again, and the improvement in the clinical photos as well. Lastly, a large older adult idiopathic scoliosis and also an extremely impressive thoracal lumbar kyphosis. Now this is gonna be treated with a T4 to sacrum PSF along with PCOs, uh, T-lifts and a unilateral PCO. Now here we'll do a uh, four, uh, uh, multiple ride construct, uh, four ride construct, which is what I'm doing currently in 2020 for uh, most of my adult uh, cases uh, instrumented long to the sacrum and pelvis. So here's her x-rays. Again, uh, 57 degrees thoracic, 79 degree lumbar, and 34 degree lumbosacral curve in the coronal plane. You see the sagittal plane, there's actually 12 degrees of thoracic lordosis, a 58 degree thoracal lumbar kyphosis, and 41 degrees of lordosis uh, with an incidence of 92 degrees. The supine coronal image, so as the thoracic curve is structural of 38 degrees, uh, the lumbar curve obviously is uh, structural, uh, bends out to only 68 degrees on supine imaging. And the lumbosacral fractional curve is also structural 28 degrees. So all these curves have to be corrected, obviously, in the coronal plane. In the sagittal plane, the thoracal lumbar kyphosis corrects a bit, uh, but it's still quite rigid and relevant at 48 degrees uh, from T10 to L2 in its sagittal kyphotic alignment. So again, I'm going to do inner bodies, T-lifts at the bottom of the construct, and PCOs throughout the entire thoracal lumbar and lumbar region. And here, the only difference, I'm going to do a unilateral L2 PSO, uh, since L2 is the apex of both the coronal scoliosis and the thoracal lumbar kyphosis. So as you'll see, that's going to help me, uh, the car that carpentry is going to help me uh, correct the, the uh, malalignment as well three-dimensionally. So my uh, force application from, the, from a rod and uh, perspective and force application perspective begins again with the right-sided rod attached distally into the uh, S2AI screw. Then I capture S1, L5, and L4, those screws, then I compress those uh, together. So I compress uh, into the lumbosacral region, which again, both creates a bit of lumbosacral lordosis and also starts to horizontalize L4 and L5 on the sacrum. Then I stop. I take my left-sided rod, engage it distally into the, uh, capturing the S2AI screw, S1, L5, and L4, and I distract on that side again. Uh, uh, since my right-sided rod is already locked down, I'm not uh, uh, taking away lordosis distally. Um, all I'm doing is further horizontalizing to try and get L3, L4, and L5 level on the sacrum. 
And again, I'll go back and do this uh, back and forth. So I'll go back to the right side, compress it a bit, go back to the left side and distract. Obviously, you have to be very careful so you don't loosen your screws. Uh, but this will work very nicely, always applying the convex compression forces first before you apply the concave distraction forces uh, because of sagittal plane realignment. Next, again, I'm going to take the left sided rod and cantilever and push that rod uh, into the thoracolumbar kyphosis uh, to uh, push the apex of that kyphosis ventrally. Again, correcting the kyphotic thoracolumbar junction and also uh, pushing the scoliosis more medially. And again, I'll capture that rod cephalad, but I'm not going to capture the apex because I have work to do for the main thoracic lordoscoliosis. I secondarily also will compress the thoracolumbar uh, convex side on the left side, you see, which will further improve both the scoliosis and the kyphosis of the thoracolumbar junction. So that's 3B. So 3A is the cantilever maneuver on the left sided rod. 3B is the convex compression maneuver of the thoracolumbar junction through the, again, through the uh, screws periapically. Now, my next maneuver is going to be restoration of thoracic kyphosis, again, with reduction screws of the thoracic apical area. Uh, uh, to a kyphotically contoured left-sided rod where I pull the spine uh, posterior medially again to both remove the scoliosis, but more importantly, create thoracic kyphosis. Lastly, I'm gonna attach the right-sided rod to the top and then do some compression forces on the right-sided rod, again, to further correct the scoliosis since the kyphosis is already locked in from correction uh, of the left-sided rod. Now I'm gonna put my third rod in which again is going to uh, be a medial uh, concave rod in the lumbar spine that's going to uh, uh, further translate and derotate the lumbar apex through reduction screws. Uh, they're going to pull uh, uh, the apex to that rod. And my uh, fourth rod applied is a seventh maneuver, basically which is an in situ application of a fourth rod uh, for stability across the thoracolumbar junction and the lumbosacral junction. So here's a, a video that's going to highlight these correct maneuvers. So here's again a double major curve where we're going to do our releases. You see a spontaneous correction from the releases and inner body fusions. So the right side of rod is applied distally first. And I again compress L5 and S1 and compress L4 into L5. That further horizontalizes the spine in the coronal plane and produces slight lordosis in the sagittal plane. And I think my left-sided rod, again, attach it to the S2AI screw, the dual-headed S1 screw, and distract that, uh, that rod, and then uh, compress the apex of the lumbar, thoracic lumbar junction, and then attach that rod all the way up. See the purple screws are the dual-headed screws, which help align the four-rod construct. The third rod, again, goes on the concavity of the lumbar curve, using reduction screws to pull that to the apex of the, uh, of the third rod on the right side of the spine. And the fourth rod is going to be an in situ rod, again, capturing the dual headed screws and the thoracolumbar junction above down to S1. You see, I always offset uh, going from two to three to four rods as I go from cephalad to caudad. So make sure I don't have a transition of just uh, two rods to four rods. So here's the final x rays. Uh, again, following this T3 to sacrum procedure with an L2 unilateral. PSO unilateral means I only take the convex pedicle out on the left side. I don't take the concave pedicle out. So it's a complete laminectomy with a convex pedicle excision and uh, vertebral body uh, decancellation uh, and partial posterior wall uh, removal. I don't touch the concave side, but by compression and cantilever, you can get very nice to see near complete correction of the scoliosis and very nice correction of the thoracolumbar kyphosis. And you see also restoration of more uh, physiologic thoracic uh, kyphosis as well. And this is really highlighted on the, on the global total body images. You see not only the improvement of the instrumented spine, but the spontaneous improvement of the uninstrumented neck and uh, a sacral pelvic region as well, following this, uh, uh, these correction maneuvers from T3 to sacrum in the limb. Here's your post-operative photos as well. So in conclusion, uh, again, the three fundam the fundamentals uh, in, defor in these deformity correction maneuvers that I've tried to highlight in this talk include right application, that occurs from cephalad to caudad when not instrumenting at the sacrum and pelvis. Again, when uh, 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 instrumenting at the sacrum and pelvis, I prefer to start caudad and put my rod from caudad to cephalad. Uh, interestingly, what I didn't highlight also is I only bend in this uh, condition uh, of, of instrumenting the sacrum and pelvis, I only bend sagittal lordosis into my rod. Uh, uh, initially, I don't, I don't uh, bend the entire bend of the rod. I just bend sagittal lordosis and then do inside to contouring of the rod uh, to apply it further up in the thoracic region. 
Uh, again, my first correction maneuver is always based on the sagittal plane correction, second on the coronal plane, and third on the axial plane. That refers to both my rod application and the force application on that rod. It's always sagittal first. I'm always thinking sagittal plane first, and then uh, uh, coronal plane second, axial plane third. Again, in addition, as I mentioned, locking in the sagittal plane correction on one side does not change the sagittal alignment with correction maneuvers performed on the contralateral side. It only helps with coronal plane realignment. And that's, again, it's highlighted at the uh, at distal end, caudal end of constructs going to the sacrum ilium, where we compress the lumbosacral junction on the right side, which helps lock in lordosis. When we distract on the contralateral side, we don't take away lordosis. Uh, that's already locked in on one side. So that's another key maneuver. That's why you always want to pay attention and, and uh, 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 oblige the uh, sagittal plane first and then the coronal plane second when doing any instrumentation correction maneuvers for spinal deformity. So I thank you for your attention.